everybody doing tonight? Hey, thanks for coming out. friends to move to the Tampa Bay area, okay? No no Tell them it's terrible here. <laughs> You're right. How many guys on down there? Is anybody? All right, that's not bad. <coughs> How many people troll for grouper here? How many people want to troll for grouper here? <laughs> Well, we're going to try to give you a pretty good bit of information. Uh, I love teaching people to catch grouper and catching fish, period, but I've been lucky enough to get halfway good at it, so. <laughs> Tampa Bay has an unbelievable fishery here, and uh, it just gets, it's been tough the last, three years. I've, I've had the three toughest years I've had in 30 years of trolling. I see the fish, I just couldn't make them eat. Last year was, you know, the fish I caught were nice fish, but this year's been the best year I've seen in a long time for bottom fishing or trolling in the bay. The only thing is lately, you know, uh, October was a good month. November was pretty decent. You know, when we had that first temperature drop in September from about 89 to 83, that, that first six degree drop always turns them on. Even though the water was still 83, that was all they needed to, to take off. Then we've had those big giant, biggest snapper I've ever seen in the bay. And you see the guy, uh, Todd Fouché on Tampa Bay Fishing Channel, he put some great info out. I used to have him do seminars at my store and I just had him do one at my fishing club and one at my marina. He does a really good talk. He's, he's a sharp guy. Yes, he is. He used to be a guide from Lake Luna and um, good fisherman. Well, we're gonna talk, let's talk lures first and then we'll get into the tackle and the trolling. Uh, if you don't have a downrigger and you wanna troll for Grouper, you got several ways to do it. You can pull the big stretch 30s, stretch 25s, you know, 20s, whatever depth you're fishing. And uh, color-wise, they kind of follow true to the jigs. Chartreuse and hot pink are your two colors that hold their truest color at the deepest depth. We got a lot of elderly guys in here. You remember Sea Hunt? That, show Glenn Lau who made the movie uh, Big Big Mouth he filmed that he went in uh, saw in uh, Silver Glen Springs one time and took a color panel down to show you what colors change at what depth even in real clear water and the two colors that hold their true color is pink and chartreuse and I used to own Bubba's jigs for 15 years these are the tails I sold and that was is one or the other and we finally come out with a glow that really works good in the bay. My best offshore color by far. And there I'm using an eight ounce bucktail instead of a four <laughs> ounce for trolling. I haven't found a, a lure that will outfish that for red grouper. Got to put a little smell on it, but uh, trolling wise, same thing. Pink, chartreuse, glow, but lately I've been watching on, online and I'm seeing all the guys using gold black bombers catching a lot of fish. So I have never used the bright gold tail, but lately they've been chewing the back of the boat off with that one. And uh, I've never <coughs> used a white in my life. And I have a friend out of uh, Ruskin there, Larry Malinowski, he's known as Fish Hawk. He kills them on plain white. And Glenn Taylor, Captain Glenn Taylor told me he was killing them on plain white. So. I'm not that stubborn. I finally <laughs> did it religiously for a couple of days. I caught 20 fish one day all on the white. I usually put, I used to always put a glow and a pink down and see which one they'd hit. If they didn't want of them, then I'd throw a chartreuse on there or something like that. But 
Once I get the second bite on one color, I just double up. And that's the easiest way. Uh, after you hear a seminar, if you're out there trolling, you'll be welcome to call me and I'll tell you what the color of the week is if I've been out. That makes it a lot easier. Just call and I'll tell you it's pink, it's gold, it's whatever. But, uh, you know, if you're going to troll a planer, you can troll these without it down there on a four ounce bucktail, which is just like that. Nice thing with these over a big lure, it has one hook that rides up. You can bounce it off the rock piles and grouper it, it just like a bass hits a crankbait coming off a piece of wood. And it'll slide up the rock and not hold a lot of time. You know, not hang, you don't have two sets of treble hooks hanging down. So it's really easy to troll it. And you know, if you put it down and you see your planer trip, all it was is dug into the bottom. So you didn't want to give your lure, you know, your lure a crank and if put it back in the holder. If it don't trip again, what does that tell you? You're about a foot and a half, two foot off the bottom. This thing shows you where you're at all the time. But uh, you can also troll a, uh, I don't know, on a planer. I, this is a Wahoo bait. It's called a Halco Trembler. And it's like a Yozuri Bonita. But it's really, really heavy duty. You got a big stainless wire, big hooks. I used to troll a big rattle traps, but I've had big fish just rip the hooks right out of those rattle traps. They can't hurt this bait, and they will crunch it. Um, so a planer, you can use a bomber model A, like a 17 or 16 A with a small lip. You just can't put anything behind a downer or a planer that has a big lip because it's going to trip it. So I prefer, I know the guys I know that are really good with planers, they all troll jigs. And uh, that's what I use 95% of the time. I'll pull one of these out when the water's a little dirty or I feel like I got to aggravate the fish. Grouper's a, a predatory strike. A lot of the fish out there you catch, what do you think they got in their bellies or their mouth, their gullets? Anybody? Crabs. Crabs. None of this stuff looks like a crab. And I've had so many with it in their gullet, they couldn't eat it if they wanted to, but they wanted to kill it because it was coming through their living room. They didn't like it. And that's all it is. You can actually aggravate them into biting. And uh, they're kind of like a bass and a snook, you know, in their in their predatory strike thing. <coughs> uh, any questions on the lures? Um, Four yeah. ounce on the bucktail. That's rather a planer or a downrigger. Now, when you run a lure off a planer, mm -hmm. how much line do you use? I probably put 20 foot of 60-pound uh, fluoro. Okay. The guy I know I talk about in Ruskin, he likes to put a few feet deeper than his depth, which means you got that much more to hand line in with a nice fish. But if he hangs a jig, you don't want to lose his planer, too. Mm -hmm. I don't really worry about that as much. Most of the time, you can go back and get it loose. So I like about 20 foot. That's enough to handle with a good fish because once that planer hits the tip, you got to hand line him in. So that's why I use, I was lucky enough to kind of be taught down riggers when I first started trolling. And they put you in the strike zone 100% of the time. In Tampa Bay, especially in the summer when we got all the rain and tannic water, you know, if you aren't within two foot of the bottom, you're not going to catch many fish. And this, I can see the ball tracking beautiful right on my screen. I can lower it, raise it. I know from doing it thousands of times, you'll, you'll hear me on a trip going, bring them up two foot, bring them down three foot. And people go, how the heck do you know to do that? I go, I've done it a couple of thousand times. And you know, that's where you either make mental notes or you make written notes. And uh, once you get used to it, you can see the ball kiting, it'll kite about three feet, maybe four if you're going a little too fast, and your lure runs about three foot below it. So I have a, a counter that shows me exactly what depth. I can look on my, you know, Lorant screen or whatever brand you use, and I can see where it's tracking. And uh, it makes it dirt simple. This, this will catch you so many more fish than any other way to do it. 
Yes, they're a little expensive, but at 22 bucks a pound, if you get good with them, a couple years they pay for it or so. I've got a pair of pins, which this is the exact replacement. This is Seahorse, a friend of mine makes these. Pin quit making theirs about eight years ago, and he started making them, and he was gonna sell them to pin. And right at the end, they said, you know, why don't you sell them yourself, and we'll give you our blessing, we'll send people to you. So he's been selling them himself. And uh, he gives you a 10-year warranty, where Penn gave you a one-year warranty. I mean, 10 years, there's nothing to really go bad on them. I got a pair of pens that are 30 years old. What do you use on your Don Regger? So you use cable, or do you use I use, braid? I like the cable. Okay. Alex keeps getting, trying to get me to switch the braid, but I don't, I'm good. If it sings a little, I either sing louder or turn the stereo up. <laughs> Usually only when the water's cold is when it really makes much noise. And lately, I haven't had it make any noise. Yeah. I think you've convinced him, though, because the last time I talked to him, he said cable now. Ben said cable, he said cable. Yeah. So he said cable. I I'm, a, a, I'm a hard sell. I did have a question about, the, yes. the, you said fluorocarbon. So we, we heard about the, the expense of fluorocarbon. So fluorocarbon monitoring. We, if you're, cause we, I used to use just plain old 80-pound triple fish for probably 25 years, caught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grouper. But then the bite started to slow for me. And I talked to some other friends that are trolling. They said, I had to go down to 60 fluoro. So I'm, I'm not a hard sell. I went right to 60 fluoro. I like to use, uh, and the reason was what? Because you get more bites simply because it's, it's less visible. I thought I brought a roll, but I guess I didn't. Well, that's okay, but then we, I, we'd heard that if it gets nicked, it can become cloudy, so Not replace it. Mono. Mono. Which one? So. I don't have trouble with fluoro. I know, like, if you're mackerel fishing, yeah. If they, you know, you're using light leader and they fray it up, it is visible, no doubt. Okay. But. We started, we actually caught more fish on All right. So yes, I'm asking. Say you hook a fish, do you uh -huh. keep going? Do yes, you go sir. neutral Absolutely. right away? Do you accelerate? You, what do you do? No, I, I, I go, if it's a big fish, then I start looking if I'm close to the channel edge, I pull into the channel, and then I, I go down to just in gear so the guy can fight it and it's not killing him back there. But if you're in any kind of structure and you slow down, the hydrodynamics is pushing the fish to the surface. If you slow down and he sees a rocky one, so he's gonna beat you there. Yeah. So you don't ever stop. Now, if I'm on up where I can't steer in the channel, I'll tell somebody to go reel the other rigger up about 10 foot so it's not gonna hang up while we're fighting that fish. <coughs> I'll keep moving and I'll slow down a little bit. But uh, if it's a skier where you can just scheme, I don't even slow down. I just tell you scheme across the top, throw him back in, and let's keep fishing. Do you so, ever set up shop and anchor and uh, drop down live bait or oh, yeah. restrict yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I have one thing I forgot to mention. Yes. We were talking about the seahorse stuff. Yeah. Right? Gentlemen, the seahorse stuff advanced sells you on this. Tonight, 15%. It's a great off. special. He's running a 15% off for anybody that would like a down here. And once you buy them, they're, these are bulletproof. They really are. Uh, you can feather your clutch because it has a direct drive instead of gears that mesh together like cannon. And you just loosen it and you feather this with your hand till you get where you want your counter and then you tighten it up. And you don't ever wear your, I had my clutch service at 25 years and the guy said, I didn't need it. <laughs> I changed the cable I think twice in 25 years. Penn's always had the best cable and Alex is using the same stuff. Any of that kind of Copper looking, you know, off colored cable, they rust really easy. So even if you wanted to put new cable on, on yours, I would order it from him and get the, uh, the good stuff. Some guys like uh, mono, you know. Some king fishermen think wire puts out negative ions and stuff. You know, they came out with a black box to hook to them and that's way too technical for me. I'm old school. So I don't have trouble catching king. They're great for king fishing. Uh, Penn always had the strongest rod holder. They had one that bolted right in here with stainless steel. 
And this one's real solid too. A lot more, a lot more cannons is like for lake trout and light rods and pin always made the best rod holder by far for down areas. Okay. And uh, that's your, that's your clutch <coughs> right there. And then your, your uh, counter is on this side. That's your counter, and you just adjust that to zero before you drop it down. Always check that, so sometimes somebody will mess with it, and all of a sudden you're hanging up, or you're not getting bites, and you look, and you bring it up. It's on five instead of zero or three. Or... But normally, with most, most of the new units now have like a 20-degree cone. So you, you, most of the time, if, you, if you're going the right speed, you're going to see a solid line. You're going to see your ball tracking right there. So you know where it is all the time. How fast do you troll? You say the right speed. Speed-wise, I call it the angle of the dangle. When I'm going, I want my cable about like that. I don't know if that's 30 degrees, 25 degrees. If it's up here, I'm going too fast. If it's down here, I'm going too slow. And it's usually about 900 to 1,000 RPM most boats. I'll look at it and I'll, I'll if, if Charlie's driving, I'll say speed up 100 or slow down 100. If the tide's pushing you sometimes, then you got to slow down. It's usually, it can be anywhere from two and a half miles an hour to four and a half. Over four and a half, you're really, you're going too fast. So, uh, how close to the bottom do you keep it? Now, going? these planers and plugs, most boats I've been on. A thousand RPMs is perfect. That's about four miles an hour on most boats. And uh, you don't have to guess around. The difference is you never know exactly where these baits are, like your planer, unless you really get good. And you mark your line, you know, if you don't break it off, you, you get the right depth and you put an indelible marker on it and you bring that to the first guide. Some guys do it like that. Uh, I just, thank God I was taught to use this and taught an easy release system that takes all the frustration out. And that's what I use. And just to show you, I'm trying to think about three weeks ago, we caught 20 fish, five keepers, and there was about six boats trolling. I never saw them hook a fish. I shot a show with Mike and Billy Years ago, probably about 2009, we went out and I said, there's a feeding period, one o'clock, we need to start then. Took five minutes to catch first fish. We caught about eight, nine double headers. We caught 30 fish with eight keepers. Had two boats following us all day that kept having to go around us. And three other boats, I never saw them catch a fish. We're the only guys using down airs. I went out, what was it, Friday, and there's 10 boats trolling. Eight of them are going the wrong direction. <laughs> you want to troll with the tide. If you're trolling against the tide, you may as well just be drinking beer and enjoying the outdoors because you ain't going <laughs> to catch many groups. You know, and through the years, Randy Rochelle and I have done a lot of seminars on this. And guys, we've had some people get a little ugly. Well, you quit talking about that stuff, you know? And they go, 90% of the people aren't hurting the fishery. They're just out there having fun. They ain't really putting a whole lot of fish in the boat. <laughs> and the other day we're out there, there's 10 boats, like I said, eight of them are going the wrong direction. And what really made me mad was one friend of mine that I just took out the week before, he's in a 32 yellow van with his friend and he's going the wrong direction. <laughs> I call him on the phone and say, what the hell is wrong with you? Turn around. <laughs> So what I'll do is I'll run up the channel, if it's an outgoing, and I'll run to where I think I can make a nice long troll, and I'll troll back with the tide. This morning, it was pretty sporty. We had a bunch of rollers out there that, I haven't seen rollers that big in a while. And you're going against the 15 mile an hour wind, and the current wasn't, thank God the current wasn't really ripping or it had really been standing. I, I wouldn't have been able to fish. Weatherman or fish weather is what I use. It missed that one because it was calling for. And when I looked at it at four o'clock, it was six miles an hour. It was 15 when we were fishing today. And it never really wanted to go a whole lot less than that. We left at one o'clock. It was still. But once the tide turned, then it 
laid down some, you know. But when that tide's bucking that east wind or northeast wind, man, <coughs> it can get pretty sporty. What the weatherman calls a, a mild or moderate chop, <laughs> you don't have a clue what a moderate yeah. chop is. Yeah. <laughs> they really don't. Let's talk a little tackle on what I use. This is probably my all-time favorite rod. It's an ugly stick custom. <laughs> Unfortunately, the dummies quit making this series. And this is the sweetest little rod because I can reel the tension down on my rubber band and I can see any kind of a hit if I got a short sitting there that I didn't see the strike or, you know, and there's a lot of, I got another rod there that's similar and there's some out there, but, uh, so stand up, you don't have to have a roller and stripper, you can just use the uh, standard, uh, you know, regular guides. I double this as a dolphin rod, you know, sailfish rod, other stuff, so. The important thing is a slick butt material. Shakespeare invented this, they actually let Penn come out with it first on some of the rods. Shakespeare calls it an ugly butt. And what's nice is when that thing's in the rod holder, and you got a fish that lays that tip to the gunnel, if you got a foam butt, you have a hard time digging it out. And eventually he's going to destroy your foam if you keep doing that. With a slick butt, you just pull a little bit and it slides right out. I like to stand up, you know, uh, which is usually a little longer foregrip. I got a seven foot, this is a 6'6", 6 6, 30 50 action. That's what I like. I run 50 pound Mamoy. Smoke blue, which disappears really good. It's 50 pound, it breaks at about 57, but I can get 50 yards more than I can Big Game or Andy or any of that. It's thinner, but just as strong. Then I use 60 pound fluoro. I like uh, Mamoy Diamond and the pink. Yozuri makes a good pink that I like, but uh, I use clear too, but most of the time now I use the pink. And then rod, real wise, I use the Shimano Takoda because it has a level line. And I go on a lot of people's boats and I take them on my boat. And I can let a little kid sit there in the rod holder and crank it. I can let grandma or anybody find a nice fish and they get excited and forget to thumb it. I don't have to worry because it won't. And I've never blown one of those level lines out. I used to use the Penn GTI series when it first came out. Because that was the first level line that would actually hold a grouper. The old Ken 209, 309, they blow that level line right off the reel. So that's my weapon of choice. Again, that reel's probably 10 years old. You know, I scratch them up a little more sometimes than I should, but uh, I have them service now and then. They keep on ticking. Any questions on the rod and reel? They don't make that real anymore. I, I have the Dakota, same. Dakota, sure they do. They well, they changed it completely. Really? I have that same exact one. They don't, that silver one the, is that a seven hundred? Yeah, a Dakota seven hundred. They don't make. They don't I, don't I thought I saw them at the ICAST show. They look the same this year. Uh, I know yeah. they come out with a smaller one than they used to have. Yeah, I, I was looking for that exact reel. I could be wrong, but I was told they don't I think make. You're it. wrong. I almost have to I swear I am wrong. There. I have one and I, I like it. I, I, yeah, I got about six it. of them. <laughs> um, yeah, so. This was another rod that Ugly Stick made. This has a parabolic action to the blank. Daiwa makes one just like this, slick butt, 30 to 50. <laughs> I'm going to grab the end of that in a minute. This has a parabolic, so when the fish lets off a little, that rod pulls back on him. And it doesn't really hurt your back because it'll really, really bend over there. And this one will actually pull down to about there, so it's not bad. I like the little softer, thinner tip than that one, but that one's got plenty of butt in it when you get a good fish. What is it that you like about the tip? Because when we're, even though we're learning to use a downrigger. Well, when you put the downrigger back, you're going to have a bow in your line. So you want to sit there and take your reel, and you'll see your line coming closer to the boat because it's getting to the ball. And then you can pull it and you can actually feel the rubber band start to stretch. So you got no bow in your line. When he hits, it's boom. He's so would up. I be wrong to say like it's kind of a softer tip? We've been trying to use a, something If a it's too softer, soft, it'll you, can, you know, you don't want to use a kingfish type soft tip. 
You want to, you know, star, I used to use a 3050 star, which is a stiffer blank, and it didn't pull down near as nice, and it put a lot more pressure on you when you hooked the fish on your back. I'm getting old. I can't take the pressure. <laughs> um, How long of a leader do you have? I'm I usually make it about eight feet. So if I got a retie, I can, you know, and if I'm rubbing on a rock pile, generally I'm not going to lose him. I very rarely cut a jig off on a fish unless it's a big fish and say I'm in three rock piles close together and I hook him and he sees that rock pile and he wants it and I can't stop him and some of them you can't stop them. You look a 32 inch, 34 inch fish, he goes where he wants for a while. So that's where you want to try to steer away from the structure, either on the sand or into the channel. Then you have a chance at landing him, but some of them, man, they feel like they're going to pull you out of the boat. Just like that Kobe behind you. Sir? Oh, yeah, Kobe. I caught a 65 pound Kobe a troll in one of the, I think the sulfur barge offshore. He pinched a nerve in my neck, had about six months worth of health care, and because uh, I forgot to, we we're on a barge. And I hit him and I had to drag. I run like what I call a seven eighths drag. You can just, so if I hang up, I don't break the lure off. And I didn't think once we got him away from the barge, loosen the drag, dummy. So I thought him was a full drag. Got him up and then we had the St. Pete sports rider, I mean, a Sarasota sports rider with us and there was three 30 pounders with him. And he wanted to try to catch one of them. So he was throwing lures at him. And then they all got tired, mine, they all went down, and mine went with them. That's when he had that rod bent over and twisting out, it was gonna just blow in my face, man. Again, I didn't loosen the drag. <laughs> so, yes, sir. So from what you're saying, when you fish, do you fish right at the drop-off, or you fish down A lot down of the structure the I fish is, I kind of draw it there, I think, on one spot there, I'll show you. A lot of it, it'll come up like that, and then right into the channel. Because when they were blowing the channel and dynamiting and drag lining, they just didn't break that off even like a lot of the channel is. So that's where your big rock up top is. And I'm going to talk about where all that is, where I troll mostly. I've been trolling the same areas for 30 years. We got enough fish. When you take some off the big structure, there's some more that's waiting to come. They're on the list. So uh, any questions on the rod or reel? The release, the, the place most people get really flustered is with the release. I, I luckily enough, the guy that taught me taught me the rubber band system, and I've passed this on to thousands of people through the. I've been doing seminars for 30 years, and you just get this. I get them right here. Mahoney's Doug just got some in today. A little brass gate clip. I've had those last 10, 15 years. They get a little tarnished, but spring still works. And then the thing that most guys never think to do, is I put a snap swivel and I take 80 pound or 100 pound leader, and I make this about a foot, foot and a half longer than my boom, so I can reach right out there and lay it in the boat. When I'm ready, you know, and your, your clips are usually only about that long. So for years, guys swiveled the boom in, beat the side of the boat to hook their release on, Plus tension clips, you got mild clips, you got medium clips, you got, you know, heavy clips. And most of them, if you leave them on the boat after a while, half the time, one of the pads will fall out. Now, Alex does make a hydrodynamic clip that doesn't spin. It's a, his one is so strong, my little fingers can't pinch it. I got to kind of saw it in there. But I always use the rubber band. Got a size 32 or 33. I use 33 most of the time. You, I let my line out approximately 50 feet with my lure. Then I'm ready to put my release on it. Then I lay the rubber band across the line, hold the left side, wrap the right side three times, snug it down, and then I drop it in the clip. And I let that out behind the ball. I just shot a, a seminar on the water today that you'll be able to see on YouTube down the line. And I let it out behind, so it's just straight back, that's straight behind the ball, and then that's when I let my, my lure down. You wanna take your 
put your clicker on and take your reel out of gear. You can set it in either this rod holder or I prefer a forward rod holder out of 45. This is in my back rod holder just sitting straight back. And I put it out at a 90 degree like that. And then I just take and feather my clutch, let it down, you'll hear it going, you know, singing at you, but it's not gonna backlash if you leave the clicker on. And then when I get there, I tighten up my clutch and I reach over and pop it in gear. Then I'll sit there and reel down until I start to see my rod tip go down. I can feel that rubber band stretch. And that's where you want to be. Nice thing with this, if you're learning, say you go into golf, you want to troll 40 feet. I go out there and I put 40 foot of cable. I put what my recorder says. I get my angle of the dangle right, my speed. And then if I'm not sure, if I don't see the ball tracking, sometimes deeper water, you won't. I let it out a foot at a time until I see my rod tip bounce. That's just my jig digging in the sand. Then I bring it up a foot. If it quits bouncing, that tells me I'm a foot off the bottom. Make a mental note or whatever. At 40 feet, I had to be 42 feet today. Most of the time, exactly what the recorder says is all you need. If you're going the right speed. Because the lure is running about three foot below the ball. In the bay, I fish structures. Some of it's four or five foot tall. One, there's one piece on the old bridge rubble that comes from 28 foot to 19 foot. And it looks like your downrigger ball is going to smack it. It comes on. What it is, it isn't the width of your boat. It's a big peak, but it's not that wide. And your downrigger ball comes on each side of it. So. But I like to run mine when I get in the structure, which I'm going to show you on the map. I always run it where I can just tip the tops. Because if you don't, you'll spend a lot of time being hung, going back, getting it loose, and you're not fishing when you're doing that. So if I'm just trolling the channel edge, which I do a lot, and I'm going on and off, and you'll see a lot of fish right on the break. A lot of them live down the side on rock outcroppings that are, you know, five, ten foot down, and when that tide slows down, they come up there to eat them crabs. And if they live in the rocks at the structure, you'll see them behind the rock when the tide's going too fast, or there's not a feeding period. When the tide gets right, the feeding period, you'll see them move right to the top of the structure. It's like fishing, I fished, uh, I call it the Dead Sea, Pleasant Grove Reservoir out there on Turkey Creek Road, and you got a lot of dredge holes in there. And I used to see the bass in the bottom of the hole. I couldn't get them to eat. One day I was fishing a pond jumpers tournament. And I watched these two huge guys in this little John boat. I don't know how they didn't sink it. They didn't have much freeboard. But they sat in one spot on one of them holes. And all of a sudden they caught 10 or 12 fish and ran, won the tournament. So they were nice enough. I said, tell me what I'm being stupid on. I don't understand what you're doing. He said, when the salooner period gets right, those fish will move right to the top of the structure and then they'll feed. As soon as it's over, we go back down in the hole, take a siesta. How many guys use salooner periods? We do now. Does everybody know what <laughs> salooner periods <laughs> are? Anybody don't know? Be honest, it ain't no big deal. You know, I don't know, where, I don't know what that when is. the moon's over, straight overhead or straight underneath, that's a major. That lasts about two hours. I'll give you a website you can go to. Gives you all of them for the month. And I'll give you a good site for the wind and all that. When it's on the surface, it's a minor about an hour. There's usually two majors and two minors a day. Once in a while, you get one with only three. <laughs> you might have one major and two minors. The old farmer's almanac always said, you're riding down the road and all the cows are standing up in the pasture eating, get your rod and go to the pond because the fish are eating too. It affects animals. They say it affects us, but I like to eat all the time, so <laughs> you can't go by me. <laughs> but I've seen it a million times out there. Whether I'm bass fishing, I'm trolling, I'm bottom fishing, it's just like somebody went ding, ding, time to eat and all of a sudden you'll be trolling and you're not seeing any activity. All of a sudden the mackerel start jumping, birds start flying and your rods start going off because you just had a feeding period started. So the time, when I go, 
I'm old, so I like to be productive. So, I mean, you, you know, some people, anytime you can go fishing, that's when you need to go. And that's true if you don't get to fish a lot. But if you want to be productive, I look at what time the salooner <coughs> periods is. Like today, we had a salooner from 7.30 to 9.30, and we had a tide change at 8.40. It don't get no better than that if the fish cooperate. What well, hurt us today was that front come through yesterday, and you got that big bluebird sky, that big high sitting there. It was a tough day. We caught two, three fish is all we caught, two keepers out of three. Uh, it can be, it can be tough, guys. Once these fronts start rolling through, I'm probably, I'm gonna fish Saturday, <coughs> maybe Sunday, because now I'm a couple of days away from that front, and I think we got another front coming Tuesday. I would even fish Monday. They're bumping the wind up and down on Monday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday look good. Hopefully they're not going to miss it. Like the, the app I use is Fish Weather. It'll miss it one out of 50 times. And they got a buoy right at uh, right outside of Port Manatee you can look and that'll tell you the, the strongest wind in the bay right there, you know. Our bay is like a funnel. I can go by that Marine Patrol station on Gandy when I used to live in Tampa. That flag would be flat. Go, oh man, it's going to be great out there. Get to Fort DeSoto, and that big flag is standing. You go, how the heck can that happen? But the land compresses the wind. It compresses the tide. So it speeds the tide up, and it speeds the wind up. By the time it goes all the way down the bay, it's blowing pretty good. Up at Gandy, it's nice and calm. You know, so keep that in mind. Does your, uh, does your fishing slow down when the tide gets moving quickly? Do yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I've had a few days where they'll eat five hours straight, they'll eat on the tide moving, they'll eat on the cylinder, they'll eat on the tide chain. They're just hungry. So what's better? Would you prefer a, a major feeding period? Or sure. Slack tide? Ideally. With well, I like to have them close together and I fish all of it. Like say I had a major from eight till 10, and I had a tide changer at noon. I'd start about 7.30, and I'd probably fish till 1.30, 2 o'clock. Because sometimes the tide will be a little late, depending on which way the wind's pushing it. Today, it stopped it pretty much a little early and on time, because it had a wind really bucking it, you know? Depends on the strength of the tide, too. But the release takes, the rubber band takes all the frustration out of, a, out of putting a downrigger down. And you'll see downriggers for sale on a cheap because guys never learn how to use them. And then they get frustrated and they just stick them in their garage and go, I never use that thing. Let me sell it and make somebody a sweet deal. So, um, what weight do you prefer to use? I use a 10 pound fish weight. I like it because it's got wings that kind of keep it from kiting so much instead of a round ball with all that surface. It tracks real straight for kingfish, tro slow troll, and live bait. Years ago, I used the big pancake weights with a big fin, but the fin was made out of steel. Within a year, year and a half, that fin would rust out and you had to buy another downrigger ball. Yeah, we've been using the eight for nine. Yeah, it's, the ten is going to. too far back. So yeah, you gotta, it's going to kite. Yeah, really well, really we're really going lures, not yeah. bucktails. Right. And I think that's making yeah. it big. And, so we're going to try to figure that angle with the dangle thing out now. <laughs> there, uh, that's the best weight I've ever used. That's what I use now for years and years. Uh, they're expensive because the price of lead, as you know, whether you bottom fish or whatever, the price of lead got crazy. Just crazy. Anything else on the downrigger, the equipment? Um, I'd say color wise on lures, pink and chartreuse, white, some guys like red and white and they catch fish. I, for some reason I owned a jig company for 15 years and I don't know, I bet I didn't throw a red and white, a red head with a white body 10 times in 15 years. I like, I have a bright silver glitter, a bright gold glitter, which were two of my number one sellers in curly tails and shad tails <coughs> three and four inch shad and five and eight inch curlies <coughs> they just had so much flash and a lot of your baits if you look at their bellies either white 
or yellow a lot, <laughs> and the gold seems to uh, get that, and then the silver just look like white bait out there. Just a lot of flash, triple X glitter. Um, one thing I always carry that's nice is a cushion. <coughs> I have one of them waiting, and somebody gets a good fish on, Charlie and I will go over there and pop it on, and that goes against you. Don't bruise yourself all up. Especially the ladies don't like, I don't like to do it either. <laughs> but uh, they work. Little things that make life easier out there. Bruises are like trophies. <laughs> One of the things I heard you mention once before was about trawling the green side. Yes, sir. I'm going to come out in a minute and cover that right there. Oh, my voice is going. I did a seminar on the boat, so <laughs> talking, running my yak a little too much today. Come out and talk about where I troll. Don't get old, guys. It hurts. <laughs> Don't want me to move this in the center, or can everybody see it there? I can't see my big ass end away. Anybody? <laughs> center be better? Yeah, yeah, yeah move it to the center. Better. Move this thing without it falling apart, I mean. All right. When you hear me talking the green side, this is the Skyway. That's the first green buoy inside the bridge. There's more big structure on each side of it than anywhere else in the bay up top. And you can come, you'll, you'll see a lot of boats bottom fishing. Most of them don't know how to bottom fish it, but they'll be on it in the way. <laughs> During the week, they're not so bad, but on the weekend, it's, and I used to come right, I mean, I don't, to me, if you're fishing straight down, if I troll, 10 yards from you, I'm not hurting you. Some guys will give you the look, you know? <laughs> and it really gives me the look when I pull a 28 inch up and then I go that way and I catch a 30 inch and they're catching little snapper and sea bass. And, <laughs> but I do that a lot on those rocks there. There's four or five big rock piles on the west side. This is up in the bay, this is east. And then there's probably about 10 or 12, about halfway to the second green buoy, they end. When I hit there, coming through here, if it's a low tide, depends if it's a negative low or a regular low, I'm gonna be anywhere from 22 to about 25 feet on, on my cable, depending if it's high tide or low tide, because I'm just trying to tip the top of some of them big rocks. And that's kind of what they look like. There's one that's right on the edge, falls right into the channel. There is a bunch of stuff by that first red. There's rock pile, there's a little reef right there, and you always see somebody anchored up on that. And I catch a lot of fish from the rocks to the bridge in 28, 29 foot of water. I got my downer here at 28 usually, and I'm just cruising that bottom right there. And we caught a lot of nice keepers. Caught some on the structure, but I catch more there. And today we caught one up here, and then we caught one up the channel, a couple of buoys. And you'll be going along, and you'll just see a nice arch with an air bladder. If you know how to read your recorder, most of the time they'll have a red air bladder. And you can see a nice arch. That's usually a grouper. Today we had one. We went by him. He's just up top. I said, yeah, we ought to catch him about that time as one of our keepers. And sometimes when the bite's on, you can have a school of fish there and you, you always want to draw a track line. If you hit one, a good fish, yell, mark it. Whoever's driving, make a waypoint. Then you just turn around, you go back and you get up tide and you come back over right down that line, right over them fish and a lot of times you get hammered again. So that's why you always want, you want to know, know how to use your electronics. I do a split screen with a 2x zoom on my recorder. And uh, so I get a really good look at fish that are real close to the structure. Now on the west side of the bridge is what you'll hear me refer to as the roller coaster. That's the old bridge rubble. Out in front of the north pier, there's probably five, six, seven rock piles. And if you just line up the north pier, you can find them. On this side, now there's probably 
15, 18, and it looks, it goes, goes from 28 to 24, 28 to 23, 22. Off the tripod right there, there's one that comes from 28 foot to 19 foot. And uh, that's the biggest one. And then some are smaller, some are larger. Uh, and I'm just trolling back and forth. Sometimes if it's a little rough, I can troll on that side and the bridge will knock it down enough I can still troll. Where I really couldn't troll up the channel if I wanted. Really not. You have spoil banks. The guy I was talking about is real good with the uh, planers. He trolls the edges of the spoil banks. That creates a, you know, a uh, feeding position there. Structure is what they're oriented to. Grouper are structure oriented fish. So you can troll some of the spoil banks. You'll just run along them and wax a lot of nice fish. Those don't get fish like the channel edge does. And more and more, I'm trying to uh, look around, find new spots, but we have such a great fishery in the bay. We ain't really destroyed it in 30 years, you know? Yeah, and we quit dumping sewage in the bay, it would sure help. Yeah. St. Pete is horrible about it. Tampa's gotten better. St. Pete's being sued now by the feds for, there's a, I'm trying to think of a documentary it's all about how much sewage St. Pete has dumped in the last couple of years. And now they got the bright idea they're deep water injecting it, and they're saying they're going below our aqua 